Hello, this is the Shuckmeister, your friendly military scientist representative of the United Citizens Federation. Today we're going to help you know your foe. The once secret threat to our brave soldiers has finally been revealed after years of research fighting our intergalactic nemesis, the Arachnids. We've been long at war with the bugs from the Klandathu system. They've managed to throw countless attacks against us, but the mobile infantry will continue to squish those bugs with 137% increased effectiveness, knowing to avoid this dangerous tactics from the bug. Would you like to know more? Starship Troopers is a fantastic movie that has a ton of discourse around it, especially with the release of Helldivers 2, which I intend to talk about in greater detail at another time. Buzz about this nearly 30-year-old film has never been greater. And that is deservedly so, since there are a myriad of interpretations about the political implications you can get out of this, since the movie has aged like a fine wine. While I don't particularly care which side you align with, bug sympathizer or not, what I care about is the science. See, the movie Starship Troopers has an imaginative alien enemy, the Arachnids. Those giant creatures look terrifying and act even more insane. It's no surprise that bugs have been a common alien threat in science fiction because of the way they act in our own incarnate world. Think about the praying mantis, for example, where females will eat the heads of males after mating. There's something inherently unsettling about insects and other arthropods, which draws so many people to want to study and understand them. Many of their body types have existed for ages before our own. The arachnid army is a formidable force that can easily decimate hundreds of thousands of soldiers by throwing countless numbers of drones at the Federation's army. There's a variety of insect types in the arachnid army, but the most common and well known are the warrior bugs, tanker bugs, and plasma bugs. The warrior bugs are the first creatures we're introduced to at the beginning of the movie, and they act as the biologically standard species of the arachnids. They're pretty large at 2-3 to three meters long with giant mandibles and camouflaged color palettes for the purpose of fighting as foot soldiers. These warrior bugs have close relatives with wings that can fly. There are two other notable special bugs that are much larger, the tanker and the plasma bugs. The tanker bugs have many beetle-like features except for the fact that they shoot fire acid out of their heads. And the plasma bugs, why, they have organic artillery cannons. You know, as one does, that can reach up to orbital distances, providing destructive cover fire. They're very reminiscent of the bombardier beetle, an animal that fires hot boiling acid out of its appendix to ward off attacks. And it's with these bugs that we have the topic of this video. All of these bugs are incredibly deadly, yet they aren't the largest threat that humanity faces in this war. But to understand what that threat is, we first need to talk about how these bugs got so big. You should be thankful that bugs are the size they are now, because they didn't used to be. This whole video is just a ploy for me to talk about paleontology. Back around 300 million years ago BC, there was a time in Earth's history known as the Carboniferous Period. In this period, plants found nearly unimpeded growth on the surface of the planet because of the few animals that ate them. This is evident in the name of the era. Carboniferous comes from the large coal deposits that date to this period. This allowed the plants to drastically increase the oxygen content in the atmosphere. This is because of a process that we learn about in grade school called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the function in which plants use sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water to create oxygen and sugar. It can be described with this equation. Woo, look, hydrocarbons, oxygen, cool things. Such a super simple formula would cause a massive increase in the oxygen content of the atmosphere, upwards of over 30%. Insects and other arthropods pods absorb oxygen directly into their muscle tissues by using a series of holes and trachea across the sides of their bodies because they don't have lungs. Their size is directly proportional to the amount of oxygen that they absorb. Introducing Arthropleura and Meganeura, two of the most well-known giant insects from this era. Discovered in 1854, Arthropleura, Greek for jointed ribs, was a massive millipede that could grow to over 2.5 meters long. And while thought to be a vegetarian, sharp mandibles could certainly do some damage. And Meganeura, Greek for large-nerved, was discovered in 1885, a dragonfly the size of a hawk. 
You'd have to have large nerves of steel to actually face down these gents. These were terrifying creatures that actually existed on Earth. And we actually know that the oxygen content of certain environments in Earth today leads to variations in growth for arthropods. For example, in the oceans of the polar regions, because of the lower temperatures, they have higher oxygen content, which allows marine arthropods to grow to larger sizes. Compare the terrestrial pill bug to the marine isopod, for example. And the relationship between oxygen content and size also works in the opposite direction, where creatures living at higher altitudes tend to be smaller. Crustaceans that live in Lake Titicaca, haha, <laughs> Nice. In the Andes, on the border of Peru and Bolivia, are two to four times smaller than their sea level counterparts. This is because there is a lower density of oxygen in the air at those higher altitudes. Assuming the arachnids have similar biology to the earthly insects, which is a pretty reliable guess considering we see one of them get dissected at the beginning of the movie, we can determine roughly the amount of oxygen needed for the Kalendathu system planets to support insectoids of such a massive size. I brought up Arthropleura meganeura to create speculative average size differentials for the creatures that we have living today versus that of the Carboniferous period. We're going to look at mass and size differences between those creatures and their modern counterparts parts to see what the relationship between size and the level of oxygen is, and then how much oxygen we would need to, say, create a plasma bug, which is the fictional counterpart of our bombardier beetle. I'm choosing the largest arachnid just to see the maximum amount of O2 needed. First, let's compare the weights of our modern insects in question, millipedes and dragonflies. The average giant African millipede has a maximum weight of around 70 grams, which is the specimen we're looking at today, and the giant petal tail is the largest species of dragonfly with a 16 centimeter wingspan and while they're fairly light because they have to fly and maintain high maneuverability they're only about a couple of grams meanwhile 300 million years ago arthropleura weighed close to 50 kilograms which is the weight of an average 14 year old american boy while meganeira would be up to 150 grams that's still a hundred times the weight of its modern counterpart phanerozoic atmosphere oxygen and carbon dioxide models show that in recent geological findings, there was a decrease in atmospheric oxygen partial pressure from 32 kilopascals to 13 kilopascals by the Triassic period. But what does this mean? I don't know. Well, atmospheric pressure is 101.3 kilopascals at sea level, which is defined to be one atmosphere, or ATM. So we're looking at something close to the percentage of gas in the atmosphere. It's not exactly that, but it's pretty dang close. The current partial pressure of oxygen on Earth is 21.22 kilopascals, but the amount, percentage-wise, of oxygen in the atmosphere is 20.9%. So when we're looking at the shift between the carbon air furnace period and now, it's roughly about 11% shift in oxygen content in the atmosphere. From here, we have a pretty simple proportionality problem. With the millipede as our best example, Arthropleura is about eight times as long as the giant African millipede. And interestingly enough, Meganeura is about eight times the size of the giant petal tail. This corresponds with an 11% decrease in O2 levels. So for each percent increase in oxygen content, an insect gains approximately 1.375 times its original size. Size. Now let's look at the very small yet powerful bombardier beetle, a measly 2.5 centimeters and 1 gram, versus the plasma bug which is 20 meters tall and 7,000 kilograms. So we're talking about a creature that would need somewhere close to 87,000 500% more oxygen in the atmosphere to compensate for that increase in size. Uh, yeah, that's impossible. Let's go hypothetical, right? Let's say that Klendathu and all of the systems have a 100% O2 level in their atmosphere. Well, then the secret killer wouldn't be the bugs at all, but it would be the air itself. This is why a ground invasion of Klendathu is destined to fail. Oxygen toxicity occurs in people with 100% oxygen exposure for over 100 hours, where they will begin to feel chest pain, coughing, nausea, anorexia, and headache, until impaired pulmonary toxicity, acute respiratory distress, and blindness begin to set in, and then, well, death. The ground invasion would never work because the arachnids, whether they realize it or not, 
They probably don't, but those brain bugs, I don't know, they're pretty smart. They have a planetary force field surrounding them, protecting them from boots on the ground of the mobile infantry. It is fairly interesting, though, that a planet like Klindathu and the others in its system are primarily deserts, and yet they're able to maintain this scale of life. This is something we see completely opposed to deserts on Earth, which tend to have smaller sized animals for the most part, and your larger sized animals that are able to actually maintain lifestyles in the desert are specifically adapted to retain water. Even more interestingly is that gravitational acceleration appears to be nearly identical to that on Earth. That's why you don't see the soldiers jumping around like moon men. It's hard to imagine how these bugs have such high mobility, given that their exoskeletons would weigh them down the most and increase with their size too. Perhaps these issues may have been rectified in Helldivers too. I wouldn't know yet because I haven't played it. However, I am going to start and I wanted to get this video out before I did. If you like it, give a like and subscribe for more science applied to all things I enjoy in my life. God bless and I'll see you all next time.